At CIA Black Site and Guantanamo Bay, identification of Al-Qaeda couriers was a priority. In 2007, US intelligence discovered the name of a trusted bin Laden courier. Last August, after years of painstaking work by our intelligence community, I was briefed on a possible lead to bin Laden. In 2009, he was tracked. August 2010, they found his fortress in Abbottabad, Pakistan. The compound had no phone, no internet. It was far from certain, and it took many months to run this thread to ground. I met repeatedly with my national security team as we developed more information about the possibility that we had located bin Laden hiding within a compound deep inside Pakistan. U.S. intelligence concluded that this house was built to hide someone of significance. Beside the courier and his brother, a third family, suspected to be the bin Ladens, lived in the compound. Last week, I determined that we had enough intelligence to take action and authorized an operation to get Osama bin Laden and bring him to justice. Over Abbottabad, in the night, helicopters could be heard. Unknowingly, Sohaib Bata will use Twitter to blog live a moment in history. Today, at my direction, the United States launched a targeted operation against that compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. When President Obama gave the order, a small group of Navy SEALs wearing night vision goggles blast their way into the compound. In the Situation Room at the White House, Officials were able to follow the operation in real time. A firefighter erupts. But the video link is cut for a long period of time, adding to the tension. The operation will last 40 long, heart-stopping minutes. Then, in the Situation Room, relief. The code name Geronimo is heard. The target had been killed. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world that the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda and a terrorist who's responsible for the murder of thousands of innocent men, women, and children. It was nearly 10 years ago that a bright September day was darkened by the worst attack on the American people in our history. The images of 9-11 are seared into our national memory. Hijacked planes cutting through a cloudless September sky. The Twin Towers collapsing to the ground. Black smoke billowing up from the Pentagon. The wreckage of Flight 93 in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where the actions of heroic citizens saved even more heartbreak and destruction. And yet we know that the worst images are those that were unseen to the world. The empty seat at the dinner table, the children who were forced to grow up without their mother or their father, parents who would never know the feeling of their child's embrace. Nearly 3,000 citizens taken from us, leaving a gaping hole in our hearts. On September 11, 2001, in our time of grief, the American people came together. We offered our neighbors a hand, and we offered the wounded our blood. We reaffirmed our ties to each other, and our love of community, 
and country. On that day, no matter where we came from, what God we prayed to, or what race or ethnicity we were, we were united as one American family. We were also united in our resolve to protect our nation and to bring, to bring those who committed this vicious attack to justice. The September 11 attack shocked Americans. America had been the target of terrorist attacks in the past, but most of them happened overseas. These attacks were seen as isolated cases by Americans. That perception will change on 9-11, when it became clear that America was now a target. Soon after the attack, Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden were blamed. America had been attacked and was not likely to give up without a fight. The deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. This will require our country to unite in steadfast determination and resolve. Freedom and democracy are under attack. The American people need to know we're facing a different enemy than we have ever faced. This enemy hides in shadows and has no regard for human life. This is an enemy who preys on innocent and unsuspecting people, then runs for cover. But it won't be able to run for cover forever. This is an enemy that tries to hide, but it won't be able to hide forever. This is an enemy that thinks its harbors are safe but they won't be safe forever. This enemy attacked not just our people, but all freedom-loving people everywhere in the world. They think freedom is our vulnerability. It is our strength. We will need that strength in the days ahead. Throughout our proud history, we have met every challenge, and we will meet this challenge. The 9-11 attacks were carried out by a small group of fanatics. Al-Qaeda, a terrorist organization misunderstood, based in Afghanistan and protected there by the Taliban government, dispatched this group. In Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda was able to provide training to some of the suspected 9-11 terrorists, including Mohammed Atta. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. This organization, Al-Qaeda, had bin Laden as its leading figure. And on September 21, 2001, George Bush made it clear Al-Qaeda and bin Laden had to lose their safe haven. The Taliban's were the target. Tonight, the United States of America makes the following demands on the Taliban. Deliver to United States authorities all the leaders of Al-Qaeda who hide in your land. Release all foreign nationals, including American citizens you have unjustly imprisoned. Protect foreign journalists, diplomats, and aid workers in your country. Close immediately and permanently every terrorist training camp in Afghanistan and hand over every terrorist and every person in their support structure to appropriate authorities. Give the United States full access to terrorist training camps so we can make sure they are no longer operating. These demands are not open to negotiation or discussion. With that address to the Congress, Bush will shape its presidency, war on terror, and finding bin Laden became priority number one. The Taliban must act and act immediately. 
they will hand over the terrorists where they will share in their fate. Tonight, a few miles from the damaged Pentagon, I have a message for our military. Be ready. I've called the armed forces to alert, and there is a reason. The hour is coming when America will act, and you will make us proud. Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and bin Laden had been warned. Surrender or face the full force of the US Army. The next day, the Taliban rejected this ultimatum, stating there was no evidence in their possession linking bin Laden to the September 11 attacks. After the refusal of the Taliban regime to meet Bush demands, the US government quickly launched military operations in Afghanistan. My message is for everybody who wears the uniform, get ready. The United States will do what it takes to win this war. And I ask patience to the American people. There's no question in my mind we'll have the resolve. I, I witnessed it yesterday on the construction site. Behind the sadness and the, and the exhaustion, there is a desire by the American people to not seek only revenge, but to win a war against barbaric behavior, people that hate freedom and hate what we stand for. And uh, uh, this is an administration that is going to dedicate ourselves to winning that war. On October 7, 2001, airstrikes started in the capital, Kabul, at the airport, at Kandahar, home of the Taliban's supreme leader, Mullah Omar, and in the city of Jalalabad. Later that day, President Bush confirmed the strikes on national television. Good afternoon. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. We are joined in this operation by our staunch friend, Great Britain. Other close friends, including Canada, Australia, Germany, and France have pledged forces as the operation unfolds. More than 40 countries in the Middle East, Africa, Europe, and across Asia have granted air transit or landing rights. Many more have shared intelligence. We are supported by the collective will of the world. More than two weeks ago, I gave Taliban leaders a series of clear and specific demands. Close terrorist training camps, hand over leaders of the Al-Qaeda network, and return all foreign nationals, including American citizens, unjustly detained in your country. None of these demands were met. And now, the Taliban will pay a price. By destroying camps and disrupting communications, we will make it more difficult for the terror network to train new recruits and coordinate their evil plans. These brutal attacks are as horrendous terrorist act as anywhere else in the world. America will never achieve its political goals by launching horrendous attack on the Muslim people of Afghanistan. The Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan has always chosen the fate of tax, the fights in the way of tax, and reasons to solve problems, but America has always chosen the militarist, uh, militaristic approach. A pre-recorded videotape of Osama bin Laden was released before the attacks, in which he condemned any attacks against Afghanistan. In early October, 82-year-old Afghan Yunus Khalas, who controlled a large part of the country's east, including the city of Jalalabad, and the cave complex at Tora Bora offered bin Laden and the Al-Qaeda leaders 
a safe sanctuary. Carlos and Bin Laden had known each other since the 1980s when Afghan Mujahideen's battles against the Soviet Union. Bin Laden accepted Carlos's offer and arrived in Jalalabad in early November. Americans and NATO focused the strikes on and around the cities of Kabul, Jalalabad and Kandahar. Following the first few days of bombing, most Taliban and Al-Qaeda training sites were destroyed or severely damaged. The campaign then focused on command, control and communication targets, which weakened the ability of the Taliban forces to communicate. When the bombing around Jalalabad intensified, Bin Laden fled into the caves of Tora Bora, south of the regional capital. Bin Laden knew the region well. Years earlier, he helped build the complex, and it is believed that some of Al-Qaeda's training camps were situated in those mountains. In late November, days after Bin Laden had arrived in the area, US intelligence tracked him to Milawa, just below the peaks of Tora Bora. An airstrike was called. For 60 hours, B-52s and F-15s bombed the area. <laughs> Bin Laden was forced to flee deeper into the mountains. CIA Field Commander Bernstein, who was charged with finding Bin Laden, requested 800 rangers to be placed between Bin Laden and the Pakistani border in order to be able to launch a ground attack on his position. The troops were never deployed, and without them, a ground assault was too risky. As the United States carpet bombed Tora Bora, Bin Laden urged his fighters to carry on against the Americans. The American campaign was predominantly an airstrike. US officials preparing for the invasion of Iraq were reluctant to send troops to force Bin Laden out of the caves. Officers on the ground were told that Pakistan would help them to block Bin Laden's escape route to Pakistan if he tried to cross the border. But in early December, Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf made it clear to US officials he didn't want to commit troops without American support. At Tora Bora, the secretive Delta Force, the elite special operations unit, planned to get to Bin Laden from behind, crossing into the terrorist hideout from Pakistan. According to the leader of the Delta Force team, the plan had a better chance of succeeding than any frontal assault. The Pakistani forces never made it and the border was never secured. Delta Force's plan had to be abandoned. They were then forced to align their mission with the Afghan Mujahideen and stay on the Afghanistan side of the border. On December 10, Delta Force got a tip as to the general location of Bin Laden in the Tora Bora area. 30 members of the team launched an assault on the position but when some soldiers were abandoned by their Afghan allies behind enemy lines, the team stopped its advance and aborted the mission. Osama bin Laden manages to escape from Tora Bora. US investigators will later learn that he didn't go south into Pakistan tribal area as first thought. Instead, took a route north back to Jalalabad. This was a risky move as he would have to pass approaching US and British forces. According to official account, Bin Laden rested in Jalalabad before leaving on horseback for a long journey to the Konar province in Afghanistan's far northeast. He is believed to have stayed there for 10 months. US authorities stayed on the hunt, but from there the trail had gone cold. US forces at Tora Bora had come very close indeed to locating Bin Laden, yet he managed to slip away, vanishing completely. Several years went by without a single tip, surveillance photos or monitored transmission of any value. 
Toro Bora taught the Americans a lesson. It was a bad idea to rely on Afghans or Pakistanis to capture or kill bin Laden. After Tora Bora, the Americans knew that next time an occasion to capture bin Laden arose, they will do it themselves. The Battle of Tora Bora will reinforce the mythical figure of bin Laden that started more than 30 years ago. In the second part of the 20th century, high birth rate and decline of infant mortality had produced a common problem throughout the Muslim world. A large, steadily increasing population of young men without any reasonable expectation of suitable employment, a sure sign of possible social turbulence. Many of these young men were the product of secular and religious schools. The education system devoted little, if any, attention to the rest of the world. Frustrated in their search for a decent living, unable to benefit from their education, some of these young men became easy targets for radicalization. A decade of conflict in Afghanistan from 1979 to 1989 will give those young men a rallying point and training field. A communist government in Afghanistan gained power in 1978, but was unable to establish lasting control. At the end of 1979, the Soviet government sent in a military unit to ensure that the country would remain securely under Moscow's influence. The response was an Afghan national resistance movement, the Mujahideens, which defeated Soviet forces. Young Muslims from around the world flocked to Afghanistan to join as volunteers in what was seen as a holy war, jihad against an invader. The largest numbers came from the Middle East. Some were Saudis. Among them was Osama bin Laden. 23 when he arrived in Afghanistan in 1980, bin Laden was the 17th of 57 children of a Saudi construction magnate. By some accounts, he had been interested there in religious studies, inspired by tape recordings of fiery sermons by Abdullah Azam, a Palestinian and a disciple of Qutb. Though he took part in at least one actual battle, Bin Laden became known as a person who generously helped fund the anti-Soviet jihad. Bin Laden and the cleric Azam had joined in creating a bureau of services, Mektab al-Kidmat, or MAC, which channeled new recruits into Afghanistan. The international environment for bin Laden's efforts was ideal. Saudi Arabia and the United States supplied billions of dollars worth of secret assistance to rebel groups in Afghanistan fighting the Soviet occupation. But bin Laden and his comrades had their own sources of support and training, and they received little or no assistance from the United States. April 1988 brought victory for the Afghan Jihad. Moscow declared it would pull its military forces out of Afghanistan within the next nine months. As the Soviet began their withdrawal, the Jihad's leaders debated what to do next. Bin Laden and Azam agreed that the organization successfully created for Afghanistan should not be allowed to dissolve. They established what they called a base or foundation as a potential general headquarters for future jihad. Al-Qaeda was born. After the war, many foreign mujahideens stayed in Afghanistan and took Afghan wives. Others returned with their experience, ideology and weapons to their home countries, 
often proceeding to fight jihad against the government there. The most extreme case was Algeria, where the jihadis fought the government in a bloody civil war that cost more than 150,000 lives. A large number of foreign mujahideens went to Bosnia to fight against Bosnian Serbs and Croats. Following the Soviet Union's withdrawal from Afghanistan, Osama bin Laden returned to Saudi Arabia in 1990 as a hero of jihad, who along with his Arab legion had brought down the mighty superpower of the Soviet Union. In August 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Bin Laden, whose efforts in Afghanistan had earned him celebrity and respect, proposed to the Saudi monarchy. He summoned his mujahideens for a jihad to retake Kuwait. He was rebuffed, and the Saudis joined the US-led coalition. After the Saudis agreed to allow US armed forces to be based in the kingdom, Bin Laden and a number of Islamic clerics began to publicly denounce the arrangement. The Saudi government exiled the clerics and undertook to silence Bin Laden by taking away his passport. Bin Laden moved to Sudan in 1991 and set up a large and complex set of entwined business and terrorist enterprises. Meanwhile, Al-Qaeda finance officers and top operatives used their positions in bin Laden's businesses to acquire weapons, explosives and technical equipment for terrorist purposes. Bin Laden began delivering threats against the United States before he left Saudi Arabia. He continued to do so after he arrived in Sudan. In early 1992, the Al-Qaeda leadership issued a fatwa calling for jihad against the Western occupation of Islamic lands. Bin Laden will become a leading figure for many young Muslims. Bin Laden reportedly showed particular interest in learning how to use truck bombs such as the one that had killed 241 U.S. Marines in Lebanon in 1983. The blast led to the withdrawal of the International Peacekeeping Force. While his allied Islamist groups were focused on local battles, such as those in Egypt, Algeria, Bosnia or Chechnya, Bin Laden concentrated on attacking the far enemy, the United States. After US troops deployed to Somalia in late 1992, Al-Qaeda leaders formulated a fatwa demanding their eviction. In December, bombs exploded at two hotels in Aden, where US troops routinely stopped en route to Somalia, killing two, but no Americans. In October 1993, shoot-down of two U.S. Black Hawk helicopters by members of a Somalia militia group led to the withdrawal of the U.S. forces in early 1994. Bin Laden's ideas worked. By attacking the Americans, they were forced to withdraw from what was viewed as the Holy Land. In June 1996, an enormous truck bomb detonated in the Kobar Towers residential complex in Dharan, Saudi Arabia, that housed US Air Force personnel. 19 Americans were killed and 372 were wounded. 
The operation was carried out principally by Hezbollah. While the evidence of Iranian involvement is strong, there are also signs that al-Qaeda played some role. Let me be very clear. We will not resist, we will not rest in our efforts to find who is responsible for this outrage, to pursue them and to punish them. Anyone who attacks one American attacks every American, and we protect and defend our own. In this period, other prominent attacks in which bin Laden's involvement is at best cloudy are the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center, a plot that same year to destroy landmarks in New York, and the 1995 Manila air plot to blow up a dozen US airliners over the Pacific. Not until 1998 did al-Qaeda undertake a major terrorist operation of its own, in large because bin Laden lost his base in Sudan. He returned to Afghanistan on a chartered plane and flew to Kabul before settling in the Nazm Jihad compound in Jalalabad. After being invited by Abdul Razul Sayyaf, leader of the Islamic Union for the Liberation of Afghanistan. After spending a few months with these three leaders in the border region hosted by them, bin Laden forged a close relationship with some of the leaders of Afghanistan's new Taliban government, notably Mullah Mohammed Omar. Bin Laden supported the Taliban regime with financial and paramilitary assistance, and in 1997, he moved to Kandahar, the Taliban stronghold. In Afghanistan, bin Laden and al-Qaeda were able to raise some money from donors from the days of the Soviet jihad and intensified the recruitment and training of jihad fighters. A safe haven in Taliban's controlled Afghanistan was created. By 1998, Al-Qaeda felt comfortable enough in this century to issue a declaration of war against Americans, and later a fatwa to kill Americans and their allies. The first act of war directly ordered by Al-Qaeda came on August 7, 1998, a series of attacks in which hundreds of people were killed in simultaneous truck bomb explosions at the United States embassies in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania and Nairobi, Kenya. The attacks, which were linked to local members of the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, brought Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri to the attention of the US public for the first time and resulted in the FBI placing bin Laden on its 10 most wanted list. In response to the bombings, US President Bill Clinton ordered Operation Infinite Reach, a series of cruise missile strikes on targets in Sudan and Afghanistan on August 20, 1998, announcing the planned strike in a primetime address on American television. Our target was terror. Our mission was clear, to strike at the network of radical groups affiliated with and funded by Osama bin Laden perhaps the preeminent organizer and financier of international terrorism in the world today. The attack failed to harm bin Laden or the al-Qaeda core, but killed 19 people. On October 12, 2000, USS Cole was in Aden Harbor for a routine fuel stop. A small craft approached the port side of the destroyer and an explosion occurred, putting a 40 by 40 foot gash in the ship's port side. 17 sailors were killed and 39 others were injured in the blast. Terrorists are determined to intimidate and prevent the United States from pursuing our worldwide national security interests. And they will continue to tenaciously look for exposed seams in our force protection armor. The attack was organized and directed by bin Laden. Inspired by the success of the attack, Al-Qaeda Commandment Corps began preparing an attack on the American soil.
Then came 9-11, the London bombing, the Bali bombings, and a string of others, all with links to Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden. In Tora Bora, failure by the United States to commit enough US ground troops to hunt him led to his escape. A few months after Tora Bora, as part of the preparation for the war in Iraq, the Bush administration pulled out many agents that had been searching for bin Laden in Afghanistan. In America, frustration was mounting over the long search. Some argued that focusing efforts on strikes against bin Laden and al-Qaeda should be the priority over Iraq. Others said that the best way to contain terrorism was to fight the enemy where he lived. As that debate raged, analysts in the CIA unit dedicated to hunting for bin Laden began to search in a new way. The al-Qaeda leaders didn't know where bin Laden was, but still managed to get instructions from him. In 1998, bin Laden's satellite phone calls were intercepted and he was located, leading to the airstrikes. After the strikes, bin Laden stopped using the satellite phone. So the most important question for CIA agents became, how does bin Laden communicate? <laughs> Meanwhile, in Afghanistan, Many al-Qaeda fighters were found, arrested and transferred to CIA Black Site and Guantanamo Bay. Identification of al-Qaeda couriers became an early priority for interrogators in various detention camps. Many believe bin Laden was communicating through such couriers, concealing his whereabouts from al-Qaeda foot soldiers and top commanders. By 2002, interrogators had heard unsupported claims about an al-Qaeda courier with the war name Abu Ahmed al-Kuwaiti. After his arrest, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the alleged mastermind of 9-11, revealed under interrogation that he knew al-Kuwaiti, but that he was not active in al-Qaeda. In 2004, another prisoner told interrogators that al Kuwati was close to bin Laden, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and Mohammed's successor, Abu Farij Alibi. He also revealed that al Kuwati had not been seen in some time. US officials began to suspect that he might be traveling with bin Laden. When confronted with the prisoner account, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed maintained his original story. Abdu Faraj Alibi was captured in 2005 and transferred to Guantanamo in September 2006. He told CIA interrogators that bin Laden's courier was a man named Malawi Abdallah Khalik Shan and denied knowing al Kuwati because both Muhammad and Alibi had minimized al Kuwati's importance, officials speculated that he was part of bin Laden's inner circle. In 2007, officials learned al Kuwati's real name, but did not disclose it. In 2010, the CIA intercepted a phone conversation between another suspect and al Kuwati. They located al Kuwaiti in August and followed him to a large, newly built compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. Surveillance photos and intelligence reports were used to determine the identities of the inhabitants of the Abbottabad compound. In September, it became clear that the compound was custom-built to hide someone of significance, very likely bin Laden. Built in 2004, the three-storey compound is located at the end of a dirt road, northeast of the city centre. Located on a large plot of land, it is surrounded by a 12 to 18 foot concrete wall topped with barbed wire. 
The third floor balcony has a seven foot high privacy wall, tall enough to hide the six foot four Bin Laden. There is no internet, no phone. Residents burned to their own trash. US intelligence established a safe house in Abbottabad from which they observed the compound over a number of months. After an intelligence gathering effort on the Courier's Pakistan compound that began in September 2010, President Obama met with his national security advisors on March 14 to create an action plan. They met four more times, March 29, April 12, April 19, and April 28, in the six weeks before the raid. On April 29, at 8.20 a.m., President Obama met with counter-terrorism advisor John Brennan, National Security Advisor Thomas E. Donnellan, and other National Security Advisors. Obama then gave the order to raid the Abbottabad compound. After President Obama authorised the mission to kill or capture bin Laden, CIA Director Leon Panetta gave the go-ahead at midday on May 1. The raid was carried out by a group of Navy SEALs. The SEALs flew into Pakistan from a base in Afghanistan. They were armed with assault rifles, night vision goggles and handguns. The raid was scheduled for a time with little moonlight so the helicopters could enter Pakistan low to the ground and undetected. At approximately 1 a.m. local time, the SEALs breached the compound's walls using explosives. Encounters between the SEALs and the residents took place in the guest house. In the main building on the first floor was where two adult males lived. On the second and third floors was where Bin Laden lived with his family. The second and third floors were the last section of the compound to be cleared. In addition to Osama Bin Laden, three other men and a woman were killed in the operation. The SEALs encountered several women and children during the raid. They restrained them with plastic handcuffs or zip ties and left them in place until the raid was over, at which point they were moved outside for Pakistani forces to discover. While Bin Laden's body was taken by US forces, the bodies of the four others killed in the raid were left behind at the compound. Bin Laden and the SEALs encountered each other on the second or third floor of the residence. The SEALs quickly followed him into his room and shot him. He was later found to have 500 euros and two phone numbers stitched into his clothes. There were weapons in his room, including an AK-47, an Amarikov pistol. However, Bin Laden himself was not armed, but nonetheless resisted capture before being shot. Bin Laden was killed by a shot to the chest, followed by one above the left eye. This was a great victory for the Obama administration. As President Obama said last night, Osama bin Laden is dead and justice has been done. And today I want to say a few words about what this means for our efforts going forward. First, I want to offer my thoughts and prayers to the thousands of families whose loved ones were killed in Osama bin Laden's campaign of terror and violence from the embassy bombings in Africa, to the strike on the USS Cole, to the attacks of September 11, 2001, and so many more. 
These were not just attacks against Americans, although we suffered grievous losses. These were attacks against the whole world. In London and Madrid, Bali, Istanbul, and many other places, innocent people, most of them Muslims, were targeted in markets and mosques, in subway stations, and on airplanes. Each attack motivated by a violent ideology that holds no value for human life or regard for human dignity. I know that nothing can make up for the loss of the victims or fill the voids they left, but I hope their families can now find some comfort in the fact that justice has been served. Second, I want to join the President in honoring the courage and commitment of the brave men and women who serve our country and have worked tirelessly and relentlessly for more than a decade to track down and bring Osama bin Laden, this terrorist, to justice. Uh, obviously, you know, we've all had disagreements and differences in the past. Uh, I suspect we'll have them again in the future. Uh, but last night, uh, as Americans learned that the United States had carried out an operation that resulted in the capture and death of Osama bin Laden, uh, we, I think we experienced the same sense of unity uh, that prevailed on 9-11. We were reminded again uh, that there is a pride uh, in what this nation stands for and what we can achieve that runs far deeper than party, far deeper than politics. Uh, I want to again recognize uh, the heroes who carried out this incredibly dangerous mission, uh, as well as all the military and counterterrorism professionals who made the mission possible. Many believe that bin Laden should have been brought to justice. His death left many questions unanswered. Is the world now a safer place? Do the West, and particularly the United States, need to fear reprisals? Was there an opportunity to get bin Laden alive in order to trial him and possibly get some answers? All we know is bin Laden is not the leader of Al-Qaeda anymore, but Al-Qaeda still exists. The new Al-Qaeda leader is Saif al-Adal, and the hunt is on. <laughs>